Good morning. Hi, I'm Sarah Ladislaw that we've been doing on climate change and the national and corporate interest, where we've had a series of government and private sector leaders come in and talk about the ways in which they see taking action on climate change as being uh, part and parcel of their core interests and how they approach their strategic vision going forward. And Total has been making a number of remarkable moves uh, uh, recently that really go to the heart of what we're trying to get at in this series, which is how do companies not only address the need to move to a low carbon transition, but also do so in a way that helps them face all of the competitive pressures that you're seeing across the board on the horizon. Um, so I think most of the folks in the room are familiar. Total is one of the largest oil and gas companies in the world, fourth largest. Uh, present in over 130 countries uh, and has formidable oil, gas, and renewable assets. Um, but maybe to get started, Patrick, would you talk a little bit about uh, what it, who Total is, what drives you as a company, for those of you who might not be terribly familiar? Total is an old company, 1924. Uh, we are born after the second, uh, First World War because France realized during the First World War that uh, a lack of access to hydrocarbons was the reason of the defeat. And we took over the shares of the Deutsche Bank in the Iraq Petroleum Company. Why do I remind that? Because it's back to one of the important uh, DNA of Total, which is we are born in the Middle East, in fact, uh, in Iraq, in Mesopotamia. The second part of Total, by the way, Elf is born after the Second World War, based on the development of uh, uh, Africa and uh, the only gas field which ever exists in France, which was a gas field in the southwest of France, which is over yet now, which is the second characteristic of the company. It's the only major oil, major oil and gas company with no domestic resource. So this company and this group has grown outside of our country, Middle East, Africa, and the last uh, area of focus for the company was uh, North Sea in the 70s with the discovery I mean, the, the North Sea Venture where Total has been one of the leaders. The second characteristic is that Total is a, a, an oil integrated company. We are doing everything with a oil molecule, you know, we explore, we produce, we, we, we transform, we refine, we make petrochemicals, plastics, we distribute, which is important, we go end to the customers. Uh, and the third characteristic, which is of course uh, each time I'm going everywhere in the world, people think we are an oil company. In fact, we are also producing quite a lot of gas. Uh, it's around 55, 45 today between oil and gas. And uh, on gas, we are more a gas producer than an integrated company. And one of the strategic axes I will develop this morning is that is to develop the integration downstream, the value, gas value chain as well. And, uh, and so that's a, a company which is... Uh, which has also the right size in this business, mm -hmm. where because we, uh, we face the volatility of the commodities and overall price, we experienced that in the last three years. Mm -hmm. And one of the lessons is size matters to have a strong balance sheet in order to, to be able to weather the storm of this type of up and downs. And we have the right size, I mean, and we continue to grow. And, uh, uh, and that's so. These are the main characteristics, I think, of the company. So we are French, so we are a little strange. <laughs> you know. um, so you, you say Total is an oil and gas company, first and foremost, uh, born in the Middle East. You also uh, have taken a position on the Paris Climate Accord, uh, that you're in support of it, and have actually been doing a lot more business uh, that's been making headlines in terms of electric power acquisitions. I think most people in the US are familiar with your position with SunPower, the solar uh, PV manufacturer, um, but maybe not quite as familiar with what you've done on the electricity retail side of the business with direct energy in France and Belgium. So, oil and gas company, but making a lot of electric power oriented purchases. What's your vision for the company? What, what, okay. What's the purpose of all of that? So it will be maybe a little long to explain fundamentally. I will take that question, the strategy. In fact, okay, you have, uh, for us, the climate change, in fact, it's a question of evolution of our markets at the end of the day. You know, we have today a world and this is the only, I don't have a speech, I only have one slide, which you should all know, which is a uh, of the world, the primary energy demand in 2017, and what are the projections in 2040? 
And in fact, you have various scenarios on this slide. So what we say, what they call the two degree scenario, or less than two degrees. So three degree, 3.3 degree, and the 4.5 degree. Yeah. And what we can observe through this slide is how the markets will evolve. And it's important for an energy company or a gas company to look to the evolution of our market, you know. Uh, and so, of course, the Paris Agreement is fundamental, first because it has been signed by 195 countries, because in fact it's a reality that there is a climate change. I know that in that country, in this country, maybe my sentence is not obvious, but this is a reality. Uh, oil and gas companies are clearly part of the problem, I would say. I don't want to be part of a problem. I want to be part of a solution. You know, I consider that a company like Total, with the size, with the financing capacities or engineering capacities, we must take the problem. And it's a field of opportunities, in yeah. fact. In particular, if you think to that as trying to have a roadmap which will be in line with the evolution of a market. What, what is written on this? And it is uh, what I, it's, it's public, and it's no, not secret to total, it's just the uh, international energy efficiency scenario. I mean, we have our own scenarios, maybe we'll publish them, but it's just public. What is written there? It's written first that uh, in 2040, if we want to be in a two degree world, we should not consume more than today, globally speaking, of energy demand which is an incredible challenge because today we are 7 billion people, 1.5 billion people do not have access to energy. In 2040, we should be 9 billion. So if you think that one objective of the world is that everybody should have access to energy, which is quite a challenge, I think the more or less the same global demand is a huge energy efficiency mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, challenge. So it's part of what any energy company must have in mind, and we are energy consumers, we are energy providers, so first thinking to energy efficiency businesses, and the way we manage our operation is a, is, is a duty for us. The second observation is that, of course, uh, it depends on the scenario, and I'm not sure that the two degree scenario will be, will, be effect, will be in place. Because in that scenario, the oil demand in 2040 should, should be around 80 million barrels of oil per day. And frankly, when you use all the technologies we have, even all plenty of EVs and plenty of, uh, we don't see a world of 80 million barrels of oil per day. But there could be a lot of innovations between today and 2040, mm -hmm. but we need more. But in that scenario, that means that the demand for oil could be lower in, tw in 20 years than today. So of course, for an oil company, it's just a challenge. You know, if, you are, if we are working in a decreasing market, we need to find other source to grow because the, my objective is that Total will continue to grow in the future. So oil, we have to face that reality and the consequence for us on oil is that we want to focus on what I call the low cost oil. It, it makes no sense for me to explore oil in Arctic just to have NGOs against us to drill a well of 400, 500, 400 million dollars I have plenty of ways to allocate better my capital by doing things. It does, make, it does not make sense from an economic point of view. And probably Sherry Amani said that 20 years ago. Sherry Amani was the uh, Saudi minister. He said the age of oil will not end because of lack of oil, like the age of stone did not end because of lack of stone. Yeah. And it's true. I think the idea that we will produce all the oil of the earth is just, is just something wrong because we have a permanent innovations, technologies, and we, we evolve, we, are, we have to think to that. So on oil, let's focus. Then the second lesson of it is that there is room for have to have more gas. A gas should, could, should be the hydrocarbon, the, the hydrocarbon of choice for the trans energy transition because it's more flexible, because there is less emission of CO2 when you make power. In fact, the real fight in terms of market share is gas against coal. I know it's also difficult. It's not difficult, by the way, in this country because it's U.S. In fact, it's the place where this fight has already been won by gas. In fact, it's true. I don't know that's why the U.S. are perfectly in line with the two-degree scenario. It's maybe the only country in the world which is in line, in fact, with Russia. No, it's provocation, but, uh, <laughs> which is true, by the way, as well. Uh, and so for us, that means that let's invest more in gas and in the full gas value chain. And not only in producing gas, but we need to invest in order to create the demand for gas. And so we, we have seen some, and when you think gas, people don't, don't need gas, they need power, mm -hmm. or electricity, or heating. 
And so this is why you see Total moving downstream the value chain from uh, producing liquefaction and uh, consuming, uh, transforming gas to power, because this is for us the basic economic. Uh, we want to be in all the steps of the gas value chain and electricity. And so including distributing gas and power to end customers, because it's part of the business. And, uh, and this is a lesson you know, of the last three years. Uh, we, uh, we managed to weather the storm of volatility thanks to the downstream businesses mm. in particular. And so you, you have this integration is fundamental to the economic model and, to, and also to the mission. Our mission is to bring energy to the people mm -hmm. at the end. And then what in this slide I have is that you have a very grow, a growing uh, business of renewables. There again, it's electricity. Mm -hmm. Renewables, solar or wind, or it's for providing electricity, because one of the characteristics of our world is that the demand for electricity is growing much quicker than the global energy demand. Mm -hmm. Digital world, uh, batteries, all that. Our world is will use more and more and more electricity. And in 2040, today you have only 25% of final demand is electricity. Tomorrow it will be much more than that. Sure, yeah. So this is what you, keep in, you need to keep in mind. And so when you build the strategy of our company, Yes, we are only in gas, but we think that we must also prepare that future because we want to, to, to be in 20 years, or I will not be there, uh, but I want the company to be still one of the major energy companies. Mm -hmm. And so it's step by step. Of course, it's diversification. There are some challenges. We can come back on it. But this is why you see us moving. And all that I described, of course, is our contribution to the climate change challenge. Yeah. Because each time that I'm taking this year, I will take $2 billion, or more than that, $3 billion, in fact, out of the cash flows which are produced from oil, and that I reallocate that to this low carbon business, mm -hmm. I'm contributing with my own, at my level, to this low carbon future. Mm -hmm. So this is the way I look at it. What about folks that say, for companies like Total that's created a venture fund, that's invested in companies like Saft, that's invested in other clean tech companies, that you can make investments in those companies, but how do you integrate them as a core part of your business? And what should the bar be for people that are trying to judge, or what's your bar for trying to judge those investments as a success? Well, two different things. We have a small cap, uh, venture fund, you know, it's for fun, okay, you know, it's we, for fun. Uh, for fun. <laughs> 200 million dollars, you know, no, it's good, in fact, you know, for me, that's a small, it's a fun story, I mean, it's a, you have, a, in a large corporation like Total, you have one of the difficulty, because we are successful, it's a form of arrogance, and of can you capture innovations which are small, which, which are far from the way we, uh, our, our teams, could behave mainly on the oil and gas. So the capital venture fund is more a, a way to go to some small matters, you know, and to identify innovations which could make sense. And it's also a way to oblige the people to listen and to keep their eyes open to what is happening around us. Mm -hmm. More fundamental, when we invest in uh, SAF, we have acquired SAF. This is, we, we spend right, $1.1 yeah. billion <laughs> to acquire a battery company, SAF. So that's, it's a real business, you know. Uh, like uh, when we are a majority shareholder of SunPower, like we will acquire direct energy. Direct energy is the, the first uh, uh, gas and, and power uh, B2C company in France after EDF and NG, so it was the first competitor and will become one of the large competitors. And when we acquire these companies, this one is for 2.5 billion euros, so it's quite big investments. Mm -hmm. It's because we, we consider that they, if they will be part of uh, our new, I mean, the, or the segment of activity that uh, we want to develop, what we call the low carbon part, I mean, and gas and value chain. So these companies, we integrate them, and uh, even if we have they have the knowledge. You know, you have no way. When you diversify, you need to acquire talents. Mm. I have no people in the company who know anything in, uh, knew anything in batteries before, you know. And, mm -hmm. and even in electricity, you have to, we, we are electricity consumers, but we don't have really the, the talent. So when we, we need at a certain point of time, if you are serious, if you want to develop in the business to acquire, to acquire not only assets, but people, which, which is people at the end who will develop the company. So all these acquisitions, for each of them, and they understand that challenge is to become the core of the development of the total group within these businesses. So we, we, so we integrate them, 
And we also try to respect them in a way that they know better than us their business. Mm -hmm. But you know, but uh, direct energy obviously will become for us tomorrow the, uh, the, the, the core of the development in the B2C business in Europe for Total. And we begin by France, Belgium. We see what will be the expansion after that. But uh, so, I mean, uh, uh, we have the financial capacity to do that, to attract these talents. And I think one of the interesting matters is that we, we are considered as being serious. It's not greenwashing. I mean, no. when you put one billion in batteries, two billion in the B2C business, and the people are interested to join the group because they see this momentum in which we, we are, month after month or year after year, building this business. Well, and it's an important signal for those industries and those sectors of, of, uh, of the seriousness that you, you, you put on their ventures as well. Let, okay, let's move to gas for a minute because you already brought it up. Very big gas player just purchased uh, or agreement with Angie uh, for their LNG business. Developing gas here in the United States, you've already talked a little bit about how across the gas value chain is, is the place to be competitive, but you're not the only company making uh, big moves in the gas space. How do you be competitive uh, developing the global gas market? Um, there is, uh, again, if we consider that, yes, the gas demand will grow, and in particular within that uh, gas demand, the LNG market is growing very quickly. In the last three, four years, it was plus 7% as an average for a year, and the future continues to grow. So LNG is uh, the, uh, the way to connect the markets. Uh, we had the opportunity, uh, there was not many opportunities, in fact, to make a, a, an inorganic growth, uh, becoming clearly number two in this market, beyond the Shell is number one. Shell made two acquisitions, Repsol and BG. There was only one left company, which was uh, RNG. So <laughs> we managed to go to get, we will integrate it. So we have now a size of, we will have a size of 40 million tons per year, which will be more or less 10% of the world market. In fact, we, it's important because there is an evolution in the gas market. You know, it was before it was a regional market with uh, not so many connections because gas has one difficulty. It's difficult to transport, you know, and there is a logistic cost. But we are clearly going because we have many, much more points of production in the US, in Australia, in the Middle East, everywhere. You have plenty of points of production of LNG and also many customers. You know, uh, there was a technology evolution with the uh, FSRU, the floating storage and regasification units. And for 200, 300 million dollars, you can have a point of access to a market like in Bangladesh, in, in Pakistan, in Vietnam, in Myanmar. So you, we are creating a network of LNG producers and consumers. And so clearly one of the main challenges there is uh, of can you optimize of the cost of logistics? And in fact, it's back to what we've done in oil 30 years ago with oil trading, you know? Mm -hmm. So you, you have to be a, a much more fluid market and we can drive the cost down, which is fundamental for the gas custom consumers at the end to bring the gas, the gas price down and energy gas price down if we want to be competitive to coal. And, and so what the evolution for me is fundamental. Total was one of the largest LNG producers, but we are becoming today, to, tomorrow, with LNG acquisition, a LNG supplier, which means mm -hmm. LNG portfolio manager, LNG trader. And, and the objective will be clearly to make at the end with LNG more affordable for the consumer. So yes, there are competitions, but it's a competition if you look at it well, it's, uh, it's big boys, you know, it's uh, the big major oil and gas major companies, mm -hmm. Shell, Total, Exxon, Chevron. So you don't, you don't see many small and medium sized companies. Of course, you have some national companies like QP, etc. But it's a good game for oil and, for oil and gas major. Yeah. It's a game between us with big national companies in front of us, you know, uh, CNPC in China, uh, CPC in Taiwan. So this is exactly the type of business uh, uh, environment, but we are accustomed to. So, I mean, for me, it's an obvious uh, case to try to, to, to develop the company, and this is really a, a strong axis of development. What do you say to folks that say gas is good as far as it goes, but it's not really the kind of, the level of clean fuel that we need, uh, particularly considering methane challenges and things like yeah, that? Yeah, that's a U.S. story, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, no, but I mean... We have to take it seriously. Yeah. There is an argument. Uh, we made. We need to measure it. I think that that's the that's type of things which, for me, is a little. This is why I say there is. I know that there are some 
NGOs which are strong about it. But uh, when we look to the data as we have internally, and we, it's a serious it's subject that we take very seriously at the, at the level of the club that we have created between the 10 major companies, the oil and gas climate initiative with uh, some European companies and uh, national companies. So we take that subject as a, the f number one subject, in fact, as very seriously. And the first step is to, 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 make, to have more data, to understand the point. Because when we look to the chain which we are responsible, which is a production, mm -hmm. we have very minimum methane emission mm -hmm. for total, it's less than 0.2%. Mm -hmm. So we are very far from 2 to 3% that I can read in some papers. Mm -hmm. And in fact, but it doesn't mean that we are not responsible because uh, the more we look at it, the more we begin to understand that it's, marked, it's more a matter of city gas distribution networks. So if in the city of Boston you have a very old yeah. uh, city gas network, you could have some leakage there, which, but maybe it's, we are also, even if it's not our business, uh -huh to look and to understand because it's a question of global approach and we cannot say we are not responsible of what is happening with the products that we provide because we want this product to be developed and, and we are all convinced uh, fundamentally, you know, when, uh, uh, we, when you produce power electricity with gas, the emission is twice less than when we coal. Mm -hmm. And I know that people advocate in particular here for clean coal, but frankly, uh, Clean coal means a, lot, so it means a lot of CCUS, and I would like to see where the CCUS is, oh, sure. uh, technologies are. So, I mean, it's easier to, uh, to, to, with gas. By the way, you probably all know that if today with a, a magic tool, we are able to switch in this world all the coal fire power plant to gas fire power plant, immediately we would be on the two degree scenario, immediately. So when people speak about uh, big technologies and all that, it's not fully true, you know? A gas fire power plant is not a high tech. It's just, a, it's just a matter of bringing the natural resource. It's a matter of convincing China and India and the US to give up on the, on the, on the coal fire power plant, I mean, which is complex. Because difficult. what is complex behind is that in the energy world is mainly driven by the affordability of energy affordability, or low-cost energy, is fundamental. And this is the, the real antagonism for me, uh, fight between climate challenge, to be able to, to get on the roadmap of two degree, is that, in fact, what drives the world is having access to a low-cost energy, to an affordable energy. Mm -hmm. Because it's the primary element of any social and economic development of any country. Mm -hmm. And so wherever I go around the world, when you go to Southeast Asia and in an emerging country, the real issue for the policymakers is to have access to the lowest cost energy possible. And today it's coal there. Mm -hmm. So they produce, they develop coal, you know? And, and so that's the real uh, challenge of to convince the people, again, it's back to, of can we drive price of gas at a lower, at a low, at a lower level. I mean, that's, that's all, all, all what we need to do. So you've mentioned a couple of times we're in the U.S. Uh, we had another prominent French individual, President Macron, here not too long ago, and he addressed uh, the U.S. Congress. I want to talk to you a little bit about your perspective on the U.S. in, in, in relation to this challenge in particular. Uh, just a quote, the president uh, addressed the U.S. Congress and had some comments on climate change, which were some people think that securing global uh, current industries and their jobs is more urgent than transforming our economies to meet the challenge of global change. I hear those concerns, but we must find a transition to a low carbon economy. What is the meaning of our life, really, if we work and live destroying the planet while sacrificing the future of our children? And to be honest with you, I think that maybe there are uh, there were a lot of folks for whom that comment resonated within the U.S. Congress, but there were also a lot of folks uh, for whom that probably was a non-starter and not really where the U.S. addresses these issues. How important is it for you, particularly because you have a large and growing presence, a Washington office uh, now as well, how important is the U.S. perspective on this challenge for your business? This is, uh, obviously, the U.S. is important, but again, I think, uh whatever the decision of uh, your policymaker is. In fact, the reality is that it's a one V country where we have seen the most positive evolution in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. So it's strange to me for a rational man to see <laughs> that in a country where in fact you have seen a strong evolution in the, in the right direction for the climate change because you have one Treasury, which is all the gas which have been discovered in this country, you are you are sitting here on a huge bubble of gas, 
Every day, the more you produce shell oil, you produce more shell gas, and gas and gas. I think it's the country which will benefit from a very long-term, low-cost gas resource and a low-price gas resource. And we have seen a shift from gas to from coal fire power plant to gas fire power plants. So whatever the policy makers, and as this country is driven first by economics, more than policy making, yeah. uh, the reality is that you have here uh, some, uh, uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic, whatever the position is of about towards the agreement, and I'm sure that one day the U.S. will come back within the agreement if they ever exist, exit, by the way. So I think that President Macron was right, and uh, on that point, he will maybe have a success. Uh, I, for us, I mean, I have no doubt about uh, the interest to invest in the U.S. And mainly, by the way, as, uh, again, the gas value chain. And so this is why uh, one of the important assets in the energy acquisition is that we are becoming shareholder of uh, the Louisiana Cameron LNG plant, and yeah. which will start end of 2019. Producing LNG in the U.S. from these low-cost gas base is an obvious business case. I mean, I have no doubt. Mm -hmm. And it's why we need to be part of it. Uh, it's also a place where you can, you, you, you have a benefit from uh, these low cost gas costs, it's also a low energy price. And so when you think to developing downstream business, petrochemicals, mm -hmm. I don't need, I mean, it's not very complex again. If I have to build a new cracker, I make it in the US, I will have access to low cost ethane, uh, low taxation, a stable country, I hope so. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, I would be, I'm not a chemical company. I mean, I have my petrochemical arms, but I will be a chemical company I would even put my own, my almost no, well not all, but a lot of money in the US. So I mean, so I mean, for us, it is really, and this is a reality. So, and you know, we have done last week or two weeks ago, we have announced that we have invested in a, in a company called Clean Energy. Yeah. Uh, Clean Energy is a US company which is uh, developing a natural gas for trucks uh, network. It's very interesting, you know. And and why did we make that investment? It's a company a market cap. Uh, was $3 billion uh, five years ago. There was a big enthusiasm in the US about LNG trucks and CNG trucks and all that. Then when the price of oil collapsed, obviously the spread between oil, diesel, and natural gas Collapse. narrowed. So the market cap collapsed to $300 million. So maybe today when I see, thanks to the US as well, when I see the oil price going up and up and up, maybe it was the right time to, to invest. And, <laughs> and so there is there for me, it is the one country where this uh, natural gas for trucks could work, it's, it's here. here. Because you again, I believe you have for long these uh, uh, giant resource of uh, low cost gas mm -hmm. uh, in the US. So there are plenty of reasons, you know, again, and uh, to, uh, and so why we are investing, uh, by the way, in the last uh, three, four years, we grew up our, cap our asset base from six, seven billion dollars to 10, 12 billion dollars soon. And so, so the US, whatever policymakers think, uh, first, the reality of climate change is there. Yeah. Second, in fact, you are, because again, but you know, it's for me, I, I, when I began my, my career 30 years ago, I began in, in, a, in uh, environmental matters. In fact, I was in charge of uh, controlling the emissions of plants in the north of France. And what I'm considering, environment progress only because economic decisions are taken, mm -hmm. not because of regulations. Mm -hmm. It's not true. You can regulate, regulate, but you know, even when you regulate, you, at the end of the day, you have to convince the, uh, the companies, the industries, to make the right investments, to go in the right direction. Mm -hmm. It's more a question, and they will do it or not to do it, even if you find them. That's not enough. At the end of the day, if you want the environmental, the air quality to progress, you need to convince them to make the investments. Mm -hmm. And so in the US, it's, it's working the economic Dynamic is, is positive mm -hmm. and will continue to be positive, you would say. So you brought up the regulatory environment. I must uh, ask you, I mean, this administration has really regarded its deregulatory efforts as one of the things it's doing that's positive for the industry in addition to tax reform. Are you seeing the regulatory and policy environment in a positive way here in the U.S.? or? Is it really back to sort of the economic? Honestly, I think compared to Europe, the regulation were much lower. <laughs> I can tell you. so. Yeah. Deregulating something which is much lower is fine, but it's not fundamental, I would tell you, <laughs> from, from my point of view. Now, the difficulty in the US for a European company is your legal, your legal system. In fact, what is not much lower at all is the level of fine. Mm. 
because we are facing a very strange mechanic system. And I think uh, in Davos, we had a dinner with your president and uh, he wanted to meet 12 or 13 uh, European leaders. Uh, and we told him, he told us, what is the risk of the US? And we answer that, your legal system. Hmm. Because we can face incredible suits, legal suits, with all your lawyers and all that, which for European companies are very strange, you know. And we face sometimes, we are able to, obliged to negotiate deals, which to us are much higher to what we should do uh, in a normal world. So that's a, that's a difficulty, yeah. but it's another way to approach the, the legal matters. So we'll need to, we are, we are obliged to learn there. Yeah. Yeah. But we learn every day. Yeah. And uh, so honestly, I think, uh, uh, one point which was, uh, on, which has a, probably a inf positive influence was after the Macondo accident, the regulations on the deep, on the offshore regulation for exploring oil and gas in the Gulf of Mexico was clearly very, very tough and very stringent yeah. and uh, very costly. So I think that some moves which have been done recently are opening again. Uh, but it's probably because the regulation was an answer to a lot of legitimate emotion, you know. Yeah. So, of course, the policy makers have made things very stringent after the Macondo accident. And even on, in our companies, by the way, we have also enhanced the level of, exi of, uh, of specifications. But we have been probably too far, so it, becoming, it was becoming too expensive. Mm -hmm. So, again, by the way, in the Gulf of Mexico, when you see the players today, it's more big players who are coming back. So the companies who have capacity to face this type of risk. And I think it's a good move to, have, uh, to be less stringent because we can, I'm convinced we will drill and we have made a big, beautiful discovery uh, with Chevron, uh, yeah. the Ballymore discovery uh, beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. We can drill very safely without being, without being obliged to, uh, to, over, to over specify the, 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 the well mm -hmm. that we are drilling. Mm -hmm. I, I want to touch on oil markets and geopolitics for a minute before we open it up to the audience for questions. You mentioned a couple of times already the last three years have been one in which companies have to uh, find out a way to be resilient to a, a volatile and low oil price environment. We seem to be in a different step now, whether you call it a rebalanced market or just a period where prices are a bit higher. OPEC is starting to look at new targets, making new signals. Where do you think we are today uh, as far as the oil we are, is, we are in a new world there. We are in the world of, where the geopolitics are dominating the oil price again. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure we are rebalancing. It's not true. Okay. It's not true. According to our internal calculation, we, the inventories are still 100 million barrel. The OECD inventories are still 100 million barrel, uh, barrel above what they should be. What they should be is, uh, in fact, the question, because uh, the OPEC has made something strange, you know, they tried and they tried to correct it, by the way. It was to compare the OECD inventories to the five-year five rolling average. Mm -hmm. Of course, as there was a growing supply, you had the five-year rolling average is going up and up and up. Right. In fact, the reality, we just, if you take the, the level of inventories in 2010, 2012, were more or less around 58 days. The, the demand has increased in the meantime. So if you apply the same ratio, we are still above, we still have above in terms of inventory. So we are not fully rebalanced. It's not true. Uh, what is clear in the market, you have a strong demand for strong demand, dynamic for demand, plus 1.5 million barrel oil per day. That's mm -hmm. clear. The OPEC, non-OPEC with Russia, Saudi Arabia, Russia agreement has been implemented efficiently. They are very compliant. That's also true. Uh, but on the top of it, clearly, you have geopolitics and uh, the announcement on Iran uh, clearly is pushing the price up. And I would not be surprised to see $100 per barrel in the coming months. Because clearly, uh, you will have some impacts. And we all have to, we know we are back to the situation where we were before the 2016 mm -hmm. agreement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, Iran has grown its exportation by 1 million barrel oil per day. So this one million barrel per, per day is, into, is in question today. Mm -hmm. And on the top of it, you have Venezuela, which is a really a catastrophic situation, and the production is declining. So you have many impacts on the supply mm -hmm. for mainly geopolitical events, not linked to supply and demand, not linked to OPEC, which are impacting the supply in, in, heavy, in, heavy, in an heavy way. Mm -hmm. And of course, you have the dynamic of the US dynamic with uh, Permian and Shell oil, but even here, 
uh, you, you have strong investments, but you have a, a lack, uh, you have some bottlenecks in uh, pipeline for oil, pipeline for gas. And when I discuss with my peers in the, who are involved in the Permian, they all tell me that it will take 18 months before to solve. So, and so we can face a situation there between today and the end of 19, with not enough new oil coming into the market and a lot of disruption of the supply. Mm -hmm. And this is why you see the price going up and up and up. And we are at $80 Brent uh, last week. We reached $80 Brent and again. I, I think it could continue. Is it for long? I'm not convinced. Mm -hmm. So it's why maybe because also I have experienced, you know, to become CEO of a company when the price collapsed to $27 per barrel, <laughs> you, you, you know what it means to be a little prudent. So we continue to drive the company at $50. I continue to, risk, to maintain the idea that there will be volatility because once uh, this bottlenecks will be solved, the U.S. Will, machine will come back again because if the price remains at $80, the investments in the industry will come back again. And so we will recreate the dynamic, mm -hmm. which will create again supply back. And at $80 per barrel, there will be some impacts on the demand. I don't think, I think a mistake which is done in the comments today, people consider that the demand is good for this year, it's true, but we'll continue next year. It's not true if we are at $80. I can observe, even in France, you know, I begin to see people complaining mm -hmm. about the, oil, the gasoline price because in the, in the last three years, the government, of course, as the price of oil was very low, has increased the taxes, which is a good game. But uh, you know, today you have a high price and the high taxes, so you have people complaining. And France is not important, but in emerging countries, I begin to see that move of governments. And if you read the weak signals in newspapers, there are matters of subsidies again back in some emerging countries, which will damage the economic growth. Mm -hmm. And so I don't believe we will keep a strong demand of 1.5, 1.6 million barrel of oil per day per year at $80 per hour. It's not true. Mm -hmm. By the way, you look what was the increase of demand when we had this type of price six, seven years ago. It was less than one million, around one. Mm -hmm. So that's why we, are in a, we have volatility, because you never manage to, know. and I know that uh, our OPIC colleagues, they dream to have a stable price. I mean, <laughs> it's just a dream, you know. But you know, three years ago, I said, whenever I interviewed, there is a, this theory of a, a price, uh, a price ceiling, there was a price uh, floor, no, there was a price ceiling, you know. Before it was never under 80, today it was never above 60, like three years. I will tell you, all that is absolutely wrong. The reality is that the market, there, there are, you have moves in these markets which could be much quicker than when you think. So the idea of stability is a dream for the ruler of a producing countries, but will never <laughs> happen. So yeah. we'll see what the OPEC will do. I, I would be them. I would, I would tell you, I would not change my policy. Mm -hmm. I would stick to the policy. Mm -hmm. Because for them, obviously, it's much better to stick to the policy, to see the price at 80, mm -hmm. rather than to, see, to, 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 keep, to, to lose the discipline. But you know, if you have cycles, it's because fundamentally you lose the discipline, you forget. And one of the main challenges for me in my company will be to try to, to manage to maintain the discipline. Mm -hmm. But even for me, you know, of course, when I see files coming to me today, last year when we made the most coal acquisition, we acquired it at $50 per barrel. By the way, it was a good move because we today it's at 25. So uh, it's much better than what we anticipated. We never, we were not pre-science. Huh? I didn't, we didn't dream about it. <laughs> so we were right to acquire the low cycle. But it's true that today when people came to my office, I'm looking to 50, I'm looking to 60. You know, it's a question of human psychology. You cannot, so the question of discipline, keeping the discipline is really, it's human. for me the cycles are linked to this difficulty of sure. maintaining, uh, uh, to be permanent. Yeah. Of course, we'll try to do that. So that's point. If oil price uh, stability is the dream of OPEC, maybe capital discipline is the dream of uh, ICs, yeah. huh? Yeah. But you know, and yeah, it's a dream because in fact, it'll be clear for us, we made huge efforts to have a break even going down to $30 pre dividend and 50 post dividend, uh, having 75, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very yeah, comfortable. Yeah. So one of the objectives will be to keep that break even at that level because that means that then we can Sorry. deliver more dividends or buy back shares to our, customers, to our shareholders, but also we can grow, use part of these extra revenues to grow the company yeah. in the new energies, low carbon businesses. You know? So I will, if I'm doing more today in this business, it's because part of the extra money will be allocated to this type of business. Mm. 
I know everybody's going to want to ask you questions. The last thing I want to ask before we open it up is clearly there was a JCPOA announcement that's yeah. been the subject of much speculation here. You released an announcement on it okay. yesterday about what it means for you and South Pars. What would you like to say about how that changes your perspective on investment in Iran, your investment in particular, but then also just the regional dynamics? You, you're so familiar in so many places in the region. Do you think it will have a broader effect as well? Of course, it's a, it's a, it's a, it will have a broader effect, but I'm not in charge of politics. I'm not a politician, I'm a diplomat, so uh, of course it's not neutral at all. It has a major effect on the dynamic in the region and we, have, we'll, we will see the effects step month after month. I mean, for us, it'd be clear, I, I've always been very clear. We have uh, decided to, to, in, to look to that project in Iran because of the GCPOA, which means end of secondary sanctions. As soon as the US decides to put back in place the secondary sanctions, there is no possibility for us to be a major company, a global company. You know, I, I would just, I took three examples, you know, press release yesterday and statement. Secondary sanctions means that the US president can decide that Total cannot have access to any US banks. I cannot run a company in 130 countries with any access to any US banks. It's impossible. This is our world. 90% of the financing of Total are linked to US banks. So it's not possible. The second possible secondary sanction is that it could give order to, our, to investors not to invest in Total. I have more than 30%, almost 35% of US shareholders. I will not lose them. It's not possible. And then it could also give order that we could be, uh, have problems with our assets in the US. I have more than $10 billion we intend to grow. So this is not possible. So it was always clear to us. We decided to sign South Pass because there was a, a, an international framework by the GCPOA, we've done it fully legally. It was an opportunity, we negotiated it. I think it, was a, a, it is a project which is not growing the export revenues to Iran, domestic gas. We made even, as we stated, we, uh, people probably discovered that we were very stringent with our teams. We, we told them we don't want one, sin, one single revolutionary words being any economic interest in any of the contractors we will work and we implemented strictly that policy so we participated i think so let's be clear it's not because we invest but we are naive and we don't see the sure. the, the, the global regional dynamic where we are very involved so at the end of the day i am in charge of protecting total you know and it's our interest of the company and the only way if we want to make that project it would be to have a a project waiver from the US. Mm -hmm. Not sure it would be easy to obtain, to be honest. Uh, but we have also a contract with Iranian, with Iran, that we respect, which is asking us to ask the support of the French authorities to get that waiver. French authorities will discuss, and as we said, we will. Uh, we are engaging to examine the possibility to get it. If you are in Washington, I will meet the people. But again, to be clear, uh, today and every state, I gave instruction to make no further commitments to South Pass 11 because the global trend is that uh, by November 4th, we'll have unwind all our operations in Iran. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the law and that's the rule of the game. And we are playing uh, and we are working with the rule of the game in the best interest of the company of Total. So um, uh, what uh, will happen to uh, the dynamic of, uh, of the region will be uh, another interesting position to observe. You know, we have a strong position in that region in, uh, in Abu Dhabi, in Qatar, and uh, in Saudi Arabia mainly. Mm -hmm. uh, we, will con we are continuing to invest in these three countries. And uh, we'll, I hope, my big hope is that it will not be, uh, we will we'll not see uh, in that region a sort of uh, an explosion. I mean, uh, not see uh, an armed conflict. Maybe we are not so far, but we'll see. That's not my my, my job to, con to try. We do our best to, to do that. Let's be clear. At the end, South Pass 11 for us was a, a nice opportunity, and we would have. Uh, but we have been quite prudent. We remind to everybody because there were plenty of figures. Uh, what we spent only until now, 40 million dollars. You know, we were. We had that tip of calendar to understood what uh, President Trump will do, mm -hmm. and uh, and so that's a look that will be. Uh, so we will do our job, uh, and 
uh, engage with the French government and the US authorities, but uh, at the end, my, my duty and the board of directors' duty is to protect the, the company, and we have many opportunities in that world, you know. Okay. Okay, uh, what we're going to do is I'll take questions from the audience. Uh, name and affiliation, question in the form of a question, wait for the microphone. I'll take three at a time, so I don't know if you want to grab a pen. But uh, we'll start with David, and then, uh, uh, hold on, sorry, you all jumped up. And then Richard, and then this gentleman here, and then I'm going to take over here. David. Uh, David Goldwyn, Goldwyn Global Strategies and the Atlantic Council. Thank you for your uh, illuminating and candid comments today. My questions are about Venezuela. Uh, as you may know, the United States is considering um, banning the export of diluent and the import of hydrocarbons from Venezuela as a way of pressuring them to respect their legitimate constitution. And the prospect that they may steal uh, the next election is kind of a forcing event. So two questions. One, uh, for Total, um, what would be the impact of those sanctions if they were implemented on the sector? Would it just change flows or would it actually achieve its purpose of, of uh, forcing a decline in production? And the second is, how do you evaluate the ethical or reputational risks of operating a country like Venezuela if it, uh, if it, if it steals an election like that and is considered by the international community as illegitimate? Thanks, David. And then go to the one behind you, Richard. Thank you. Yeah, thank, uh, R Richard Newell, Resources for the Future, uh, something totally different. Um, you know, Total is a, a French company, and France historically has been heavily invested in nuclear power in the electric power sector. As Total becomes increasingly involved in the electric power sector, do you have a view on the role of nuclear either in your company's portfolio or more generally within in the power sector? Okay. And then this gentleman in the white shirt right there. Can you just put your hand up? There you go. Nice teamwork, guys. Hello. Um, <laughs> Rob Pittman from Natural Resource Governance Institute. Um, in, in recent years, there's been increasing momentum around the idea of disclosing contracts between governments and companies um, to increase accountability and trust. Um, there are now 40 governments around the world that are doing this, um, and 18 companies have come out publicly in favor of the policy. Total has been um, a really you know, strong mover in this in this space. Um, it was the first super major to come out with a pol policy in, in favor of contract transparency. And it also goes further to say that it would also advocate for contract transparency in the countries in which it works. Um, I'm just interested in how you're going to be rolling out this policy. Okay, interesting questions. First, Venezuela. Yes, we are, we are involved in, this, in Venezuela. Um, for two assets, we are producing gas, domestic gas, and frankly, it's a zero negative operation, so it's not very important. And then we are still producing uh, AV oil within a, a GV, uh, L, which is uh, operated by PDVSA, together with Statol, in the, in, or in Ocobelt. Uh, the production is declining because you have there a lack of everything, a lack of money, a lack of tools, a lack of uh, maintenance become an issue. We have really some safety uh, safety concerns. We make some audits recently in order to see because we are running uh, an upgrader, so we are decision to continue or not to run this upgrader is there. Having said that, there is also the political landscape. We have been obliged to put all our people out. There is no more expatriates in Venezuela. Uh, it was impossible to keep families and even for, you know, as it seems that they are the, the government that is willing to take some people and to put them into jail for funny acquisition, my first duty is to take care of my people wherever I am. Not only the expatriates, but also with Venezuela. So we, have, we are trying to, to take care of all of them. And uh, so that is clearly a, a big concern. The philosophy in total is that, uh, and it has been, uh, it's deeply rooted in our DNA. We stayed in Myanmar for decades, despite all the criticism and the reputation risk. Because we consider that as long as we can conduct our operations according to a code of conduct, we must stay, even during difficult times. Because there is, it's easy for us to say we leave because we don't like it. But again, if I don't like Myanmar by that time, I don't like Venezuela, tomorrow it will be Sudan. I'm not in Sudan. But Oil and gas is where it is, and okay, I, I could maybe choose, but I'm, I, we are deeply thinking that it's also a matter of standing together with the people of a country where there are difficulties. Having said that, the limit of what I said 
is the international laws. If it's forbidden to stay, if it's impossible to stay according to a kind of conduct, then we will have to leave. Um, and so today's situation is clearly degraded. Uh, and uh, I will not make any political comment, but uh, obviously we can also, it's a country which was uh, 20 years ago, a very beautiful country, you know, PDVC was one of the best company in the world. For me, it's a pity. I mean, it's, it's incredible to see off the degradation there for the people living there, for the economy, and we are observing the collapse of a country, in fact, in the 21st century. That's a matter of, uh, it was a democracy. It's maybe not very much the case today, to be clear. We are, we are so we, uh, we continue. At the, end, at the end, let's be clear, for Total, uh, it's not a very important in terms of capital employed. It's quite not, not very big, you know. But, uh, but the philosophy, the DNA is that you have to stay as long as you can because people will remember. One day it will come back. I think Total uh, will be there for longer than the political regime of Venezuela. So people like in Iran, they remember when the company uh, stands together during difficult times. Even the politicians, you know. So this is a way. So, and in this business, leaving a country is a very tough decision because it takes a lot of time to convince the people that we can come back, that we are loyal. It's a question of loyalty. It's a question of uh, values, all that. So again, but if the values are no more, all values are no more respected, we will have to be left. Nuclear, nuclear is, um, clearly Total will not invest in nuclear. I've been very clear about it. It's, uh, it's capital intensive, it's uh, nuclear. If I was in charge of an oil and nuclear company, I would, I would do only nuclear and not oil. <laughs> Why? Because nuclear is plenty of security concerns, you know, securities. And, and for me, it's, it's difficult to be, it's a segment where I think the state have to be involved. And, and so I no, I'm not willing to have the state in my, among my shoulders. I prefer to be a, a nice company, privately run, I mean, no problem. Uh, no, but nuclear, I think for me, most seriously, there was before uh, uh, the Japanese accident, um, Fukushima. Fukushima and after Fukushima. Fukushima for me has, a, has, has changed the views that we have all on nuclear. Because you had a huge accident in, a, in, in one of the most developed countries where we all think that Japanese and the capacity, technological level and capacity of control was strong. So that reveals that there are some, and this was a major accident, I mean, more than a major accident, it's a catastrophe. So from a CO2 point of view, from a climate change challenge, the nuclear share in the energy mix should grow because it's CO2 free. And the question of nuclear waste is a 1,000 year scale effect. Once, and at the same time, the CO2 challenge is a 100 year. So you could, rationally, you could do more nuclear, but I think you have this security issue, which is a, a major point. Mm -hmm. And I think it's difficult to promote civil nuclear, while at the same time, you don't want to have military nuclear, because all that is, is mixed somewhere. And so I'm, um, uh, France is a very specific country. We have, uh, you know, we are always strange in France. You know, energy in France is an independent country. We have built this nuclear industry, which is, EDF is a beautiful company, running that very well. You have a consensus in France. Public, the public opinion is not against, it's very strange, despite Fukushima, despite Chernobyl. So I have a strong belief between the French people and their nuclear industry. Even if uh, we'll have to face some uh, renewal, the cost of nuclear is increasing because uh, safety standards are increasing. So all that makes a big debate, even in France, where we are willing to, to go to escape and to, go to, to lower the nuclear share, to go more to renewables. Uh, I don't think there is a big future for nuclear. One country may be exception, which is China. But even in China, after Fukushima, the rhythm of building new nuclear plants has slowed down even there. And then uh, transparency. I think it's, uh, I mean, let me be clear, when I became CEO, I had a debate about uh, fiscal transparency with my colleagues because we were criticized because we are not publishing the list of all the consolidated affiliates of the company and where they were established. 
And I took a strong position. I told them in the 21st century, we have to be transparent. A company like Total, in fact, we are global companies. We are a form of economic power. Uh, $170 billion of market capitalization. And the society is looking to us as being more powerful than many countries, in fact. And so we cannot just say we are because we are uh, businesses, we, meet the, we are hidden in our... We, we are, I'm not hidden at all in France, I can tell you. I discovered that we can become CEO. Each time I was seeing something publicly, it was making some headlines. So it's not true. A company like us, we have to assume our responsibility vis-a-vis -vis society. And the society is acting us more and more, they want to understand how you can make billions of dollars. And I think it's a legitimate. We can, and this is important. This is for me something that we need to take into account all the global companies. If you see populism um, growing in many countries, it's also a message to us. It's a message to us. And we cannot just say, we pay our taxes and we are rid of that. We, we, we have made our duty towards a society because we pay taxes. People are asking us, otherwise it is our business model which will be into question. You know, when people are, in many elections, are voting against, uh, for less protectionism, uh, less open trade, etc., more protectionism, less open trade, it's against us somewhere. And so, I, we need to be more act proactive, and transparency is part of it. So I have published this whole list of subsidiaries, with, uh, and yes, we had still 11 subsidiaries in even tax seven countries. So reality, 11 out of 1,000, it's not much, you know, we have done big efforts. And so on the contract story, I think we have to encourage the governments. The limit is that I'm not ready to publish myself on my internal site all the contracts, because these contracts are with governments. I have to convince the governments proactively. And you know, there was a debate, for example, in Senegal. Uh, we have obtained uh, last year a direct exploration contract with Senegal uh, by a direct negotiation, which was perfectly clear. I was uh, myself, I went there to say, and there was a debate. And we have convinced the Senegal government to publish it. And it's public. There is nothing secret. But this is, as we are working with sovereign rights, you know, they are awarding the license. They have to do it. I, I will not do it myself. And uh, recently there was, I think, a report about transparency. Oxfam has published one. We were among the top five. So my board was very proud of it. And, uh, but I will not, there were three cate five categories. Leaders, only two companies. The leaders are the ones who publish themselves. No, I will not publish myself. I will, I will remain sub-leader, but I will, be a, I will continue to be a, a leader towards the government. I think it's part, and it is the interest of the governments as well, you know, because, and, but the limit of transparency is what we are doing today with, uh, because there is a European regulation, which is not in place, by the way, in the US, which is a distortion of competitiveness or controls. We are publishing a table with all the money that we are giving to governments. The world. Frankly, this table is Absolutely not understandable. <laughs> you know, we have big, we have tables, in, we have plenty of things. It's very complex to establish. And last year we had a debate about Angola, which was an absolutely wrong debate. But people want to reconcile what is the taxation paid by a company, which is a complex system, with what they can see in the state budget. It's absolutely not possible. So I think there is a dream there that the more you publish, but I have no problem to publish that figures. The issue is that then we face questions which were wrong, and we have at the beginning of a sort of, uh, I would say, uh, uh, dispute, which was absolutely uh, no ground, no, 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 it was wrong, so we had to explain again. But again, let's consider it is part of what we need to do to be uh, acceptable to with the society, so. Great. Okay, we'll do another round. Get your hands, let me get you in order. Okay, we're gonna go here. The gentleman all the way in the back. And the, and the person next to them. So I promise this side of the room. Uh, hi, uh, hello, Peter Sumler with Capital Intelligence, um, uh, Middle East, North Africa. My question is more of an um, old question. Uh, national players in Europe seem to be like passe or anachronism. Um, your footprint's very similar to ENI Group of Italy. You're both sort of state influence. Um, is this time that you'll be merging with um, ENI and Total, I mean, it makes sense on risk diversification, bring it back and be a more like free market player in the oil business. Thank you, sir. Fun to announce in Washington. Here you go. And then go to those in the back. Okay, great. Yes, uh, hi, Gugaraz with Argus Media. Uh, the phrase we heard from Brussels on uh, was practical guarantees, practical guarantees for Iran to continue uh, be able to sell its oil uh, 
and you know products. What kind of practical guarantees would Total take to offset what you described the effect of secondary U.S. sanctions? Great. And the person next to you, please. Hi, uh, Anar Virji with Al Jazeera English. I just wanted to clear something up on um, the issue of applying for a waiver. Today, um, President Macron said that uh, Europe will try to protect its companies during business with Iran, but companies like Total can make their own choices. Um, so just to clear things up, is the French government uh, supporting Total and asking for a waiver? I know uh, you mentioned that uh, Total has um, asked the French government for support. Those Merging today and I, you don't think I will answer? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I will answer, I already answered. I told you that I don't want the state to be among the sh any state to be among the shoulders of Total. Uh, then, next question. Uh, practical guarantees, I answered, I think. We need a US waiver. It's easy. The <laughs> Again, we will engage with the French, and we are engaging with French and European governments to understand what they can propose. But uh, fundamentally, uh, we need a U.S. waiver because this is the only way to protect us from a unilateral decision from the U.S. to apply sanction to Total. So maybe the diplomacy between Europe and U.S. will find a solution and we will look at it. But at the, at the end, we'll have to take our decision in the interest of our company and to protect the company. And there was a precedent uh, in 1996, 1997, when we made the first South Pass project. We, we had the, such a waiver. It was a precedent. It was a result of a diplomatic discussion between Europe and the US. Mm -hmm. Are we in a situation today where we could have it? Again, I'm, uh, I will consult with many uh, U.S. officials and French officials. So yes, we will engage. I cannot tell you, again, because it's also a matter of royalty vis-a-vis -vis Iran. We have a contract. We have to respect the contract. We have some uh, a way forward, maybe to opt out at the end. And this is, uh, again, I told you that uh, if there is no clear answer before November 4th, we will have unwind our operations. But uh, I'm, uh, I think it's, uh, it's probably a, a big test for uh, the European, uh, US Europe uh, relationships. But again, it's beyond Total, all that. Total is a, is a corporation. We are a commercial company, you know. And uh, uh, we have one case. We have also other objectives in the, in the company. And, uh, uh, and so we cannot mix the. Uh, uh, I'm not a, a government. I'm not. A, it's not my job. It's not our, our objective, you know. And we're not. We have to continue to develop our group in the best possible way. And if we can do it, we'll do it. But I mentioned the reason why the U.S. are important to Total, and that's the case. Mm -hmm. So Europe has a challenge. The, the world has a challenge, in fact. The what would be not good, neither for the US nor for Europe, last comment on that, is that at the end, if only uh, Russia and China can make business with Iran, I'm not sure it's very good for what we represent in the world, Europe and, and the US. And this will be the reality. So if you think from a higher point of view and the global interest of the world, the way that I think the allies of the Atlantic allies should think to that, do we want to give to uh, all this Middle East region to uh, China and Russia? This is what we are doing, step after step. That's a more global comment. OK, we'll do one last round. I have a Twitter question, though, so I'm going to get that one in, uh, which is, companies struggle with effective communication, yet Patrick has personally developed a strong Twitter platform clearly highlighting uh, where Total is going. How are you the only CEO brave enough to do this? So that's one. <laughs> and let's see, we'll do one right here and then uh, this lady right here. Sorry, Herman. Right here. Um, Warren Wilczewski, Energy Information Administration. Um, Total seems to be following a pattern that has been established by one of your peers, Exxon, which is 
uh, going downstream past the refining sector, you made a, a major invest. You you are making a major investment in the United States in a joint venture with Novakem and, and Borealis. You've also announced last month a joint venture with Saudi Aramco, and then just this week another one with Sonatrach in Algeria. So. While you mentioned that the petrochemicals are a minor component of your business, it seems like this is where a lot of your money is going right now. Would you mind commenting as to what kind of a trend you're seeing in the energy sector vis-a-vis -vis the petrochemical industry? Yeah. And then we'll do one final one right here. Uh, Ivana Yamalkova, FTI Consulting. Mr. Puyane, you have taken a leading role on an, on an initiative known as the Hydrogen Council, which was launched at the World Economic Forum in Davos last year, bringing together CEOs of energy transport industry companies to essentially create a vision for hydrogen uh, in the energy future. So going back sort of a full circle to where you started uh, with your vision for Total's transformation and your vision for the role of gas uh, uh, in that transformation. Where does hydrogen fit in and concepts such as renewable hydrogen, power to gas, uh, and so on? Thank you. Three things. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm the only one. Uh, <laughs> it's a challenge from my communication department. I think, no, I think it's, uh, uh, but I can tell you all the tweets are, are emitted by myself. We have no delegation at all. Good to know. I refuse to do that because it's my, when, I, when something is emitted, it's my name. I signed it. And so even if sometimes they help me to prepare to send me the photo, I become an expert. I can make, you know, copy paste and blah, blah, blah. But I, can, <laughs> I can do that. Maybe because I, I'm younger than some of my peers. Even I think, I'll be clear. I think, I'm, I think you have a new generation. It's a question of generation, of CEO's generation. You know, I'm, I'm the first CEO in total which is using uh, emails and all these tools immediately, which creates some problems because you have direct access. And by the way, my direct report needs to reinvent the way they interact with me because yeah. there is not a question of you have access. So you, you run the company in different ways. And tweeting is for me uh, also what I answer today communicating with people. I think we need to also to, so sometimes it's just saying where we are, what we do, but it's a way to, we have a society which evolves and we need to, to be part of it. We cannot be out of it. Okay, it's only a small exercise, but by the way, people, even in the company, they follow me for the tweetings, you know, as a tweet. So, I mean, they know where I am and we, we go around the world and we, and they, it's also a question of motivation and people are proud and so, so we, we can understand. It's a way that the world is working, you know. So it's not because we are one of the major company in uh, what is considered as an old industry. We are not an old industry at all. We are a very uh, modern and very uh, useful industry and participating to these debates, even, even if it's only in the energy fields that intervene, where I am competent. I think it's, it's part of being an actor of the society. We need to be, we are in the society. Uh, second, but I'm proud to be one of the leaders, you know. Uh, petrochemical, no, don't miss it. I mean, uh, we, we, uh, we invest more or less $3 billion per year to downstream businesses. I was in charge of refining and petrochemical. So the strategy is to invest on large integrated platform. In that way, I copy Exxon. When I joined this business, it was in 2011 because I was only in upstream before. I had a very interesting meeting, meeting dinner with the Exxon president of downstream. He told me there is only one way to do it, is to invest permanently on the same platform during years and years and years and years and years and to capitalize Bolton investment. So we have five, six big platforms in, in the world. One is in the US, in Port Arthur. So there is logic. You will, see, you will see us continuing to invest around this platform. And refining is more complex to me to understand exactly Investing in refining is a little dangerous because to have a competitive advantage in refining is not so obvious. We had one in, in, in Saudi Arabia because there we were able to build a giant refinery together with Saudi Aramco, having the access to a very low cost of energy and heavy fuel. So we had two advantages. Petrochemicals, it's easier because the polymer business, the petrochemicals, you have 55, 60% of the world plastic, petrochemicals, which is based on NAFTA. So as soon as you can have access to a advantage feedstock, ethane in the US, ethane in the Middle East, you are sure that your petrochemical plant will be competitive compared to the NAFTA crackers. Uh, 
So for me, the game, you will not see total investing in any NAFTA crackers, or that means that I'm becoming to have, to have a problem. Uh, you will see total investing in petrochemicals where we have an advantage of the feedstock. And this is the case in all the countries, the projects you mentioned, either in the US because of the gas price, or in Saudi Arabia, or in, even in Algeria. Uh, by the way, we are not so small, and huh? we are number 10 in petrochemical in the world, you know, so we are, we are not such a small company. But when, when I think it's small, it's, it's that, in fact, it's a business where it, you, you can develop, add, add another $100 million, another $100 million of results, but a petrochemical project will not suddenly give you $1 billion of additional profits, you know, it's a, it's a lot of step-by-step -step approach. But again, we are, yes, there is a demand for polymers. We have to be careful, uh, so, uh, however, and I'm sure that we'll see a collapse in polymer price soon because you have too many projects, uh, that there is one thing that people forget is the recycling mm. of plastics. And recycling of plastics when you're, um, it's, is really a request of the society. You have more and more regulations in Europe, like always, we are going too far, 50%, which is absolutely not achievable, but okay. Let's, let's do more and more and more. Uh, but this will become reality, and this will impact the necessity for new crackers. So you have somewhere, people consider that the future of oil is only petro petrochemicals. No, I mean, uh, yes, but there is a limit, like always. You know, you cannot just consider that. So this recycling uh, phenomenon, you need to take that into account, and there is a limit. So for us, it's petrochemicals, but only on feedstock, which have an advantage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, let's over investing. Uh, we, you have some people who have a different view, which is good. You know, mm -hmm. I don't say I'm right. Hydrogen. Um, no, I'm not a leader of hydrogen, you know, I can be a, the real leader of the hydrogen council is air liquid, you know, Benoit Poutier is much more competent than I am. Um, we are friends, so why are we embarked in that is I have a strong belief that a company like Total, we need to understand all these energies. All that is interconnected. You know, I cannot just decide I invest in natural gas for trucks without understanding the dynamic of hydrogen for dedicated truck fleets. Because it's a question of competition between all these energies. Our views is that today hydrogen is still more expensive than natural gas. And there is a, a big, so it can work, for example, you can imagine in cities where you will have, because of air quality in cities, that you will have a, a sort of big hydrogen station at the entry of a city where the trucks will rotate, but it's quite a heavy infrastructure. You cannot dream about having a hydrogen pump at each, uh, net, each station. It doesn't work. Right? Uh, you have also a question of source of hydrogen. And unfortunately, people are dreaming, I know, about uh, power to gas, but you know, making hydrogen with electrolysis is a very high, high cost technology. That's why in refining, we are used making a lot of hydrogen, but C taking methane to make hydrogen, which creates CO2. So you have there a problem of where the hydrogen is coming from and a global CO2, uh, I would say, uh, calculation about the best way to do it. We have decided with Angie to invest, uh, to make in particular in one of our biorefinery that we're investing in France. We will make, we have a contract elapsing by 2022. So we want to, to make it in an industrial scale because it's good to, to understand the challenge. But when you really invest, you see the figures, you understand what are the challenges, and then you open your mind. So I think, but my view on it is that it's more a longer term, uh, natural gas, but maybe in 20 years. So we need to invest, even if the question after that is uh, how much do I invest, and what are my priorities in terms of level of capital allocation? Mm -hmm. you, you, uh, when you think about initiative, there's another initiative I did not mention at all in my, my speech, as I'm in the US. I want to speak about it, which is a carbon uh, price leadership initiative coalition. I think carbon pricing is really fundamental. We will, I should have said that during my, my I'm sorry for my state. Okay. Without any carbon pricing, there is no way to, 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 to reach a world of two degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, because this is the only, ele this is the economic element which will drive the choice of the economic investors. Mm -hmm. We don't need to have $100, this is too high. We make a mistake, we're afraid everybody by saying that and nobody wants to do that. Uh, you know, the UK experience has, has been superb. In UK, they have just put 20 pound per ton or 18 pound per ton. And in two years, we have seen the electrical system 
of the UK shifting from coal to, to gas. So it's not, and we joined, we, there was a, an initiative by uh, some of your old uh, US treasurers, uh, uh, wise men, and we joined it last year to, to, to call for $30 or $40 per ton in a system where in fact it will not impact the consumers because you will recirculate the proceeds. I think it was, it's a brilliant idea, and I hope that uh, We'll, we'll, we will be able to put that in place. We cannot advocate for a world price. This is nonsense. Obviously, the world economies cannot accept the same level in India than in Europe or in the US. So let's stop that idea that we need to, to have the same. But let's try to make step-by-step -step approach on it because it will help the transition that we were discussing. Absolutely. And to make the right choice according with this element. Absolutely. Thank you for Patrick, your attention. It is always so great to have you here. I hope your opening of the Washington office means you'll be back more often. You are always welcome at CSIS. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Please join me in thanking Patrick. Thank you.